Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Um, let me, okay, do you see that? Do you see the slides? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so thanks, thanks a lot for the, uh, for the really nice introduction. Um, and thank you all for, for coming. It's, uh, it's really nice to be here. Um, and I hope we have a, next, a nice time for the next one and a half hours or so. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about probability, but maybe before I want to talk a little bit about what mathematicians do, because I mean, you, you all have had some kind of exposure to mathematics, of course, in high school, and you've had more exposure to more advanced mathematics than most people your age. Um, but, you know, in the beginning, um, when you sort of see mathematics for the first time, one might easily sort of get the impression that it's mostly about computing. But of course, it's really not about computing. Um, actually, I mean, this is a room full of computers, uh, which was a job in the, you know, until about the 60s or 70s or something. And so computing is something that, in some sense, anyone can sort of learn within a few weeks. It was considered to be a relatively low-skilled uh, labor kind of job. And, and of course, then at some point, you know, calculators came around. Um, in computers and pocket calculators and so on. And so you didn't need to hire people to do the calculations anymore. Uh, but that's really not what mathematics is about, right? I mean, it's a little bit like saying that writing is about spelling, right? I mean, just because you know how to spell words doesn't mean that you know how to write and you can actually be a great writer without knowing how to spell because somebody else can just do the spelling for you. Right? Uh, and it's, a, it's exactly the same with mathematics and and also in a way mathematics is not just about numbers either right i mean it's it's generally about concepts um and so in a way it's a little bit you know i don't know i mean maybe in school you've seen this uh, allegory of the cavern uh, by plato where you know plato was somehow imagining uh, the situation of a few people of these people here who live inside of a cavern and they never go outside in their whole life, right? And the only thing they can see is like shadows here on the wall of the cavern. So for example, you would have other people sort of passing by here and then the sun sort of projects their shadow on the cavern and they can just sort of see the shadows. Um, and, you know, they have to imagine the world outside just from seeing these shadows, right? Um, and the idea being, well, that there is some kind of idealized world out there, the world of ideas um, that we don't really have access to, that we, you know, we really just sort of see projections of it, we just see shadows of it, and we try to kind of imagine it and to explore it just by kind of seeing these shadows. Um, and so in some sense, mathematics is really about kind of exploring uh, this world of ideas and sort of building this world of ideas. Um, and it's really ideas in general. So if it's all, all ideas that you can, ideas that you can kind of explain in a way that doesn't have any kind of contradiction and that is in some sense complete so that one really knows exactly what you're talking about, right? So in some sense, mathematics is about describing things uh, in a way that doesn't leave any kind of doubt uh, about their truth. And, and it's about also sort of thinking about concepts that don't have any kind of contradictions that you can find it. You can really show that they have no contradictions at all. Um, so in that sense, it's very different from, you know, other endeavors in life, if you want. So, for example, it's, it, you know, it's almost like the opposite um, of what one would do in politics, right? I mean, somehow uh, in, in mathematics, you try, when you talk about something, you try to define it as precisely as possible so that there's absolutely no doubt about what you mean. Whereas, of course, if you try to convince, you know, a very large room full of people about something, then it's 
much easier to actually be slightly vague and so that then people can imagine the thing that they want. Uh, and so it's easy, so you can you convince different people who would like different things, you know, by being sufficiently vague so that they, don't, they all think that you, you know, want to do what they would like you to do, even though they all like to do this slightly different things, right? Uh, so mathematics is kind of the opposite of that. So you really, when you, whenever you describe something or you talk about something in mathematics, other mathematicians know exactly what you mean. And if you take any two other mathematicians, they would completely agree, at least ideally. I mean, you know, it doesn't always work like that, but most of the time it kind of works like that. And they would really kind of agree on what you actually meant, right? And, and so that, in some sense, it kind of allows us to, you know, to find things that are actually true, right? I mean, like nowadays, um, you know, people have become extremely cynical how about truth or, you know, I mean, it gets to a point which is completely ridiculous where people don't even agree somehow on, you know, reality or things that are in front of their eyes anymore. Um, mathematics is somehow, in some sense, it's a nice place where, you know, people still manage to actually agree by and large. Uh, and the reason why they manage to agree is that they manage to actually describe things in a way that, you know, doesn't leave any doubt for interpretation uh, and doesn't have somehow any kind of contradiction anymore. Um, so that in some sense, it's, you know, at least my point of view, I mean, you know, different people have slightly different opinions on that, but I would say that's one way of somehow looking at mathematics. Um, and then, you know, Historically, mathematics, the development of mathematics has been very closely somehow intertwined with people wanting to actually describe reality, right? Not just some kind of idealized abstract world of mathematics. So in some sense, you know, we're building this kind of world of ideas, which, which is kind of up there, you know, in a cloud somehow floating above reality. But, but there are lots of links, right? So for example, physicists, essentially the job of a physicist is to kind of bring reality and mathematics together right? and to find out what kind of mathematics can actually describe reality or in which way mathematics describes reality. Um, in the way people doing modeling, they also do somehow the same thing. It's physics and modeling is very, they have very similar kind of jobs, and in some sense, it's the approach that is somewhat different. Right? So somehow in physics, you try to find fundamental rules, and then you somehow build more specialized rules from these fundamental rules. So it's kind of a bottom-up, uh, whereas modeling is a bit more top-down, where you somehow say, oh, I don't really try to actually understand things. Uh, I just try to somehow find some mathematical model that actually fits reality in some way. Um, and then there's actually a third way also, which is through computers in a way, which is, it's kind of a funny thing because in some sense, computers are a little bit like some kind of a, you know, physical realization of abstract mathematics. I mean, you can do, you know, you can formulate proofs on a computer. You can actually ask a computer to check mathematical proofs. Uh, or you can you know, simulate bits of mathematics on a computer. So, so there, there's in some sense a sort of more direct link between the very abstract kind of mathematics and you know, physical reality. Um, now, the type of mathematics that uh, I work on is called probability theory. And so, you know, so, so maybe one thing I should also sort of dispel uh, from the beginning is that, you know, some people think, you know, if you're probabilist, that means that somehow magically you're able to compute probabilities of all sorts of things. And then you could, you know, bend them to your advantage and uh, win at horse races or win the lottery or things like that. I mean, uh, unfortunately, it's not really like that. Um, so I don't have any kind of uh, magical recipe for winning you know, horse races or the lottery or anything like that. Um, but you know, we try to you know, find out 
sort of describe some or study some mathematical models which are often somewhat re related to physical models that you know describe some piece of reality if you want um, that have some randomness in it um, and so what does it actually mean for something to be random right I mean that's something which is really not very easy to get your head around um, and it's actually something that even you know even probabilists wouldn't necessarily actually agree if you put them on the spot of what it exactly means for something to be random and what exactly a probability is. Um, but I try to sort of, you know, explain it as well as I can. Um, the sort of general situation that you're interested in here in probability theory is, you know, some kind of experiment, but experiment doesn't necessarily mean, you know, doing an experiment in a lab it's somehow any kind of situation if you want uh, where there are different possible outcomes or there are different things that could possibly happen uh, later on um, and you try to predict what's going to happen but you don't have all the information that you need in order to make the prediction right so it's simply completely impossible for you uh, to completely predict the outcome uh, but still, you would like to say that, you know, maybe there are two possible outcomes and, you know, one of them is more likely than the other one. So you somehow you think that there's better chances for one to happen uh, than the other one, but you can't be sure which one of the two is going to happen, right? Um, and then you would like to somehow assign numbers to that. So, so these numbers, they kind of depending on the situation, they can be interpreted in, in different ways. So um, one way is a sort of more a priori belief kind of situation is like, you know, you ask yourself how likely it is that something is going to happen. Um, and how do you measure how likely something is? Say, what does it mean uh, if I say that some, I think that there's, you know, 25% probability that something is going to happen and 75% that something else, right? So there's sort of two outcomes and one of them, I say, oh, that one, I think it's going to happen with 25% uh, probability and that one with 75% probability. Now, there's two ways in which you could kind of interpret these numbers. So, so one way is to say, oh, if the same kind of experiment can be repeated many times, Right, then you just repeat it many, many times and you check how often did this happen and how often did this happen. And then if you repeat it many, many times, well, this should mean that, well, this outcome happens about a quarter of the time and this one happens about three quarters of the time. Right? That's one way of how interpreting probabilities. But sometimes there are things that you can't repeat. Right? So if you ask yourself, um, I don't know, what, what's the probability um, that the Austrian government is going to collapse next year? Okay. It's not something you can repeat, right? I mean, either it collapses next year or it doesn't collapse next year, uh, but you can't go back in time and try it again and see, you know, next time around, does it collapse or does it not collapse, right? It's a one-off thing. Um, and so, so then you can interpret these as somehow like fair bets. Like if you had to make a bet, you know, on the government collapsing um, and say, you know, if it collapses, uh, you know, say you're, you're allowed to bet on the government collapsing, then what should be a fair bet, right? So say if um, we both, bet on it i bet that it doesn't collapse and michael bets that it collapses right and then whoever we both put money in a pot right uh and then we wait for a year we see if it collapses or not and then if it collapses michael gets all the money and if it doesn't collapse i get all the money um, and then somehow we have to agree on how much money we each put in right into the pot and so if we think that the outcomes are, you know, about 25%, 75%, 
uh, well, that would mean that one person should put about three times as much into the pot for both of them to think that it's about fair. So, so that would be one way of, if you want, of thinking about probabilities for things that you can't repeat. Um, but then, you know, okay, so you can try to somehow assign these probability to possible outcomes of sort of experiments. Um, so one thing which is, which you already see in some sense from this discussion, and which is kind of important, is that you know the probability of something is not really something intrinsic, right? So it's not like the temperature or something, right? It's not something that you can actually go measure. So, uh, and in particular, it's something that can actually be different for different people who look at the same situation, right? Like for example, if I if I toss a coin, then it can come up head or tail, so it's probability that it comes up head is a half, probability it comes up tail is a half. There's no reason for favoring one over the other. So if you wanted to make a bet, the fair way of betting is that the person who bets on heads would put as much money as the person who bets on tails, because there's no reason to think that there's you know, more reason for the coin to come up one way or the other way, right? So there clearly the probability is sort of half, half. But now if I flip the coin, um, and I put it on my hand, right? And so say, so here is a coin, right? So I flip the coin, I put it on my hand. And now I look at it. So I see how it came up. But you haven't looked at it, right? So I didn't allow you to look at it. So I hide it like this. Um, so from your point of view, the probability that it came up heads is still a half, right? Because you have no, there's no reason to believe that it came up one way or the other. But for me, it's I know what it is, right? So if it came up heads, I know it. And so then for me, the probability is one because I know what happened. So for the same event, somehow it doesn't, its probability depends on who's actually looking at it and how much information they have, right? So different people looking at the same thing might have different information. And then for those people, it, the same event would not actually have the same probability because they have different information. So it's kind of a subtle, you know, it's quite a subtle concept to get your head around, right? So even though one always somehow thinks, intuitively it's somewhat clear what you mean when you say that something has one chance of being free of happening or something like that. But when you actually think about what it means, um, it's, it's really quite a subtle uh, kind of concept. Um, but then, of course, you know, there are, there are rules for manipulating these probabilities, right? So, for example, if there are different outcomes, for example, um, you roll a dice, so there are six possible outcomes, either you can roll a one or a two, three, four, five, six. Um, and then, well, the probability that, you know, you have a two coming up is going to be one over six. The probability that there's a three coming up is also going to be one over six. And the probability that it's going to be a two or a three is going to be one over six plus one over six. So if there are two possible outcomes, right? So if there are different outcomes, say A, B, and you know the probability of A and you know the probability of B, uh, and the two are somehow mutually exclusive, so it's not possible that both happen at the same time. So it's either one or the other or something else. Uh, then the probability that one or the other happens is just the sum of the two probabilities, right? Um, and then on the other hand, if there are things that are independent, um, then the probability that uh, both happen, they actually multiply probability that A happens and B happens at the same time, if there are things that are independent, so that what it means to be independent intuitively, it means that knowing whether A happened or not doesn't give you any information that's relevant for figuring out whether B is going to happen or not and vice versa, right? So knowing something about this guy tells you nothing about this one and vice versa then the probability that both happened 
just going to be the product of the probabilities. So like if you roll a dice twice in a row, knowing that you did got a one first time round doesn't tell you anything about what you're going to get the second time round, right? And so then the probability of getting say a one the first time round and a five the second time round is going to be one over six times one over six, one over 36. So you have these rules for manipulating probabilities. So there are some very basic rules like this. And there's all, you know, a couple more somehow uh, relatively basic rules like that. Um, and then as probabilists, we sort of take this as a kind of starting point, right? Um, and then uh, try to sort of see where it gets us. One. And of course, you know, the very starting point that we needed to have is that there are always, at some point, you need to assign some probabilities to some outcomes. So, and so I've already given you several examples like the coin toss and the rolling of a die. Um, and in both of these examples, like the different outcomes can basically not be distinguished. Like if I toss a coin, right, then whether it comes out head or tails, makes no difference to you know, the way I'm going to toss it or anything. Um, and so it's completely indistinguishable, except if I actually then look at what comes out. But as far as the mechanism is concerned that produces the outcome, it's completely indistinguishable whether it comes out head or tails. And so then in that case, it's very natural to assign the same probability, right? So if you toss a coin, you would assign probability half. If you roll a dice, there are six possible outcomes if the die is completely symmetric, there's no reason to favor one over the other. And so you would assign probability one over six to all of them. Um, there's another more subtle guiding principle, and I'm not going to say too much about that, but it's, uh, but it's actually extremely important in probability theory. Um, and maybe I'm going to mention a little bit, I'm going to go back to this at the very end of the lecture. Um, and it's something that's called universality. And um, what it says is that in, in many cases, the way the actual details, if you have something random, which is an effect of many different random things combined together. And I mean, I know that this is super vague, uh, but for example, you can think of, you know, toss a coin a thousand times. So you, you toss a coin a thousand times and then you ask yourself, how many heads do you get? You think it's about half, right? So it's going to be about 500, but then 500, you know, is it likely to get 600 heads? Maybe that's quite a lot. Actually, it turns out that's very unlikely, but you know, maybe 520, 530, that's actually quite possible. Um, so typically if you toss a coin n times, so n would be a thousand in my example, then on average, you're going to get n over two heads, but typically it's not going to be exactly n over two, right? The probability that you get exactly 500 heads if you toss a coin a thousand times, it's also pretty small, right? That doesn't seem very likely either. And so if you, you know, if you did a drawing of somehow, like here, um, the number of heads, once, uh, and here, what's the probability of seeing that number, then, well, if I toss it a thousand times, there's going to be some kind of symmetry around 500 sense that it's going to be just as likely, you know, because I can't distinguish head and tails and the number of tails is going to be a thousand minus the number of heads. It's going to be exactly as likely to see, you know, 510 as it is to see 490. So that picture is going to be symmetric around this line. And if you draw it, you're going to see actually something that kind of looks like this. That's kind of a shape like this which is called the uh, Gaussian distribution, uh, named after Gauss here. Um, and this distance here is going to be about 
square root of a thousand. Okay, so which is about 30 in this case, 31 or something like that. And so, so that tells you that, well, typically you're going to see somehow roughly between you know, 450 and 550 heads. So, so we, know, we know that it's very unlikely that you see either less than 450, and it's also pretty unlikely that you see more than 550. But it's quite likely that you see, you know, in the region of about 500 plus minus 30 or so. And the thing is, the shape of this curve here, uh, that's something which is universal in the sense that if I do similar kinds of experiments, but instead of coin tosses, I do rolling of a dice, and then I count somehow the number of times I get a one. This time I don't have a perfect symmetry anymore. Uh, but if I did a picture for a thousand times rolling of a dice and I plot the probability of getting so and so many ones, it would look exactly the same. Right? And uh, just you know, maybe different scales, but it would be exactly the same curve. It's always this Gaussian curve here. And so that's somehow a, one very important sort of guiding principle in probability. And that's something that people actually even still uh, do research on, which is, you know, like how comes that in some sense uh, the same distribution, this Gaussian distribution, or I mean, there are a few others that also show up in natural ways, but how comes that there are these, you know, relatively few distributions that show up, you know, all over the place, all the time in many different contexts. Uh, and that's something that's to some extent, it's understood there is a theorem called the central limit theorem, which explains to some extent why this Gaussian distribution shows up very often. Um, but in some sense, it's much more universal than just what the central limit theorem tells you. Um, so, so now, one thing which is a uh, maybe kind of a, a feature of, that shows up very often when you do somehow, when you compute probabilities of things, is that you very quickly end up with either very small or very large numbers. Um, and so, so one thing I just wanted to do is to give you an idea of, you know, how large a large number really is or how small a small number really is, right? Because we have this very powerful notation with, you know, exponentials, right? And so we can write things like, you know, 10 to the power 10,000, right? So I can just write it like that. It's a big number, okay? um, But, you know, how big is that number really? I mean, can you imagine somehow how big that number is? And my claim is that it's completely impossible to imagine a number like that because, in any kind of real sense, such a number is infinity, right? And, and in which sense is it infinity? Well, you know, if you look at the size of the whole universe, well, that's pretty much the biggest, or at least the whole visible universe. Right? Uh, well, that's about the biggest thing that you can imagine. And the smallest thing you can imagine is something like, you know, the diameter of an atom or the diameter of an electron or something. Right? So you take just one elementary particle and you ask yourself, what's the size of the elementary particle? There's nothing smaller than that in the universe, right? So the whole universe is only about 10 to the 40 times the size of one elementary particle, right? And, and the same in terms of time. So if you look at the whole age of the universe from the Big Bang to now, that's the longest time you can imagine because that's all the time that there is, right? There is no more time than that. Um, and then the shortest time you can imagine is somehow, you know, if you just look at like the time that it takes say, for an electron to go around the nucleus of, a, of an atom in some sense, right? You, you sort of think of like the fastest things that you can imagine. Um, in some sense, there isn't really anything in nature that sort of takes less time than that. Sort of uh, at smaller times than that, everything looks frozen somehow, nothing moves. Um, and again, the ratio between these two is only about 10 to the 30 something. 
So, so if you look at somehow like, you know, how many pixels are there in the whole universe, right? So you imagine like the whole universe from the beginning of time until now. Um, and, you know, you ask, you say, you, di you divide the whole universe from the beginning of time until now into little cubes that are the size of the smallest particles you can imagine. And they have a little time duration, which is as short as the shortest time you can imagine. And then you ask yourself, how many of these pixels does the whole universe consist of, right? So that would be like a complete description of the whole universe of everything. And it's going to be, well, basically this to the power three times this, which is about 10 to the 150, right? Which is way smaller than this, right? It's like, even if I did 10 to the 150 and I do 10 to the 150 times 10 to the 150, I still get only 10 to the 300. Right, which is still ridiculously smaller than this, right? So as far as we can, as far as the numbers that we can actually make any sense of our concern, 10 to the about 200 or something is pretty much the bigger, that there is no number bigger than that that's ever going to show up in any meaningful way in any description of reality, right? Uh, so any number bigger than that is really infinity and anything smaller than one over that is really zero. And so now if you start computing somehow probabilities of things that are pretty unlikely, you very quickly end up with somehow ridiculously small numbers, right? So there's this famous example, which is called the monkey's paradox, right? And so, so what's that? So, the, so you imagine a monkey, and the monkey has a typewriter, and it just types at random, right? So the monkey just types at random. Um, and then what you hear, you know, often somehow the statement of the paradox just says, oh, if you wait for long enough, at some point, the monkey is going to type the whole works of Shakespeare. Well, because, you know, you just take random letters and everything's going to happen at some point, right? You just wait for long enough. Um, but, you know, how long do you actually have to wait? Well, let's not even want, like, the whole works of Shakespeare. So let's take just the first page of Shakespeare, right? So a page is about a little bit less than 3,000 characters. Um, there is, how many characters are there? Maybe 26, so, okay, there are spaces and commas, it's maybe about 30, but anyway, let's say there are 10. Somehow, okay, 10 is an approximation to 30. Um, so then the probability of getting the first one right is one over 10. The probability of getting the second one right is also one over 10. So the probability of getting both right is one over 100, right? Remember, we have to multiply probabilities. So then the probability of getting the third character right and the first and the second is one over 10 times one over 10 times one over 10, which is one over 1,000 and so on. Now, if we want to get the first page of the work of Shakespeare, we have to get a 3,000 characters right. So the probability that that happens is one over 10 times one over 10 times one over 10 times one over 10, 3,000 times. So it's one over 10 to the power 3,000. So, 10 to the power 3,000 is way bigger than anything you can imagine that any number that ever shows up in the universe, right? So the probability that this happens is one in 10 to the power 3,000. So even if, you know, every atom in the universe was a monkey that somehow types a letter every single time, it turn, you know, an electron in that atom sort of, you know, runs around its nucleus, well, you know, in the whole age of the universe, they would only have had a chance of getting about the first 150 characters right, which is, a, you know, maybe like two lines or something uh, in Shakespeare. So, you know, when one sees somehow this reasoning, when people say, oh, this is very unlikely, so, you know, it's probably not going to happen, but it might still happen one has to really see how unlikely is it really, right? I mean, if something is one chance in 10 to the 3,000, that would just never happen. And it would genuinely never happen. Because 
there's no way in the whole universe that this could possibly happen, right? And even if you had zillions of universes at your disposal, it, it wouldn't happen. So, so that's something which uh, one has to somehow be aware of is that very quickly when you start computing probabilities of things that get kind of unlikely, they have a tendency of quickly become very unlikely. Um, and in some sense, that's also why uh, probability theory in some sense really allows you to actually say things, right? Because it allows you to some extent to figure out which are the things that are not ridiculously unlikely, right? And then one of those things is probably going to happen. So it still gives you some kind of information. Um, now, remember, um, I mentioned at the very beginning this thing about, you know, like if there's different outcomes and they can't really be distinguished as far as the information that you have is concerned, well, then the natural thing is to assign the same probability to them, um, which is true. But one has to be a bit careful also with that principle. Right? So, so I want to just show you one kind of little paradox which shows um, how careful one kind of has to be uh, with this principle. It's called the envelopes paradox. And so the situation is the following, right? So imagine I have two envelopes and the only information I give you is that one of them has twice as much money as the other in it, okay? Uh, but you don't know which one, right? So now I allow you to pick one of the two envelopes and open it and look at what's inside. So you pick one of the two envelopes, you open it, um, you look at how much money is inside. So there's some amount, um, let's call it X, say 10 euro or something. Right? So then the only information that you have is that in the other envelope, there's either twice as much or half as much, right? That's the only two possibilities because that's the only information I gave you is that one of the envelopes has twice as much and the other one has half as much. So now I give you a choice. So you can either keep the money or you can change your mind and you can take the money that's in the other envelope. Well, of course, if you change your mind, you look at the other envelope, it is, if it has less, then you know, that's too bad for you, right? I mean, you, you can't go back. Um, and so now the question is, you know, should you actually change your mind? Um, and of course you want to get on average as much money as possible, right? So, so now, well, what should be the reasoning, right? So naively you would think you would do the following reason. I see, you know, whatever amount of you are in that envelope. Um, the other one, there's two possibilities, either x over two or two x. It's either twice as much or half as much. And there's no reason why one should happen more often than the other one. I mean, the information I have is completely symmetric. So I should assign probability a half to both possibilities. And so then now either I keep the money and I get x for sure, or I change my mind and then how much would I get? Well, of course I don't know, but on average I would get, well, there's a half chance of getting X over two and there's a half chance of getting two X. And so on average, I get, well, one half of X over two plus a half of two X, which is five X over four, which is more than X. So I should actually change my mind. But this calculation, was completely independent of what X actually is, right? So it means I always have to change my mind. So it means I didn't even have to open the envelope in the first place because I know that I will have to change my mind, right? So I should never take the envelope that I think I want to take. I should always take the other one. But what does that, but why, right? It makes no sense. So obviously it doesn't make any sense. Uh, so where did I go wrong? In the, in the reasoning. Uh, and so the point here where I went wrong is 
that I assumed that the two possible outcomes are completely symmetric. But that's actually in reality, it's really not the case, right? Because even if you, if you think, you know, I on purpose just called that amount X, but if I gave it a number and if it was like 10,000 euro, so you open the envelope, you see 10,000 euro. So now the other one's either 20,000 or 5,000. You know, would you actually take the chance? You know, probably not, right? I mean, probably you would take the 10,000 pocket then and be happy, right? I mean, because you would think, well, you know, probably most of the envelopes actually only had 10 euros in them or something. And then the fact that I got 10,000 euro in the envelope means I was already super lucky. There's no way I would put 20,000 into one of these envelopes, right? So, so actually, you know, you have some kind of expectation of, you know, how much money I'm willing to give you. Right? And so if what you see is already more than what you think I would be willing to give you, then from your point of view, it's actually very unlikely that the other envelope has twice as much. Whereas if you open the envelope and you just see five euros in it, uh, it's like, yeah, it's maybe a pretty good chance that the other one has 10 euros, right? So, so then you would actually switch. And so actually you do have some information that comes from the amount that you see, which comes from the fact that I'm not going to put, it's not equally likely, not every amount is equally likely. And in fact, also, as a mathematical model, it doesn't actually make sense because there's no way of having a probability distribution on the possible amounts of money for which each amount of money is equally likely. Um, and so, so you start in some sense here in this reasoning implicitly, one starts from a probabilistic model which doesn't actually make any sense. And so then one just gets a nonsensical. Uh, answer. Uh, but, you know, these sort of mistakes, things like that happen in real life, right? So, so when people somehow think about some very naive uh, probabilistic model and fail to take into account uh, some aspect of reality that actually makes the model not be a very good model for what you're trying to explain with it. Um, so, you know, from a mathematical point of view, if you just think of it as being like a simple math problem, okay, who cares? Uh, but the thing is that very simple, like probability problems or probability models like that, they do actually show up in real life. And they show up in a way that has like real consequences on people. So, so the story that I just wanted to mention here is that, so Sally Clark, she was um, a British person who had uh, two children who died very young, right, from, uh, from unexplained uh, reasons, right? So sometimes it happens that when you have a young baby, um, it just stops breathing uh, and it might just die overnight, right? And you don't know why, nobody knows really why, uh, but it kind of happens. It doesn't happen very often, but it might happen, right? Um, and this lady had this happen to, to one of her babies, to her, actually her first baby, I think. Um, and then a couple of years later, she had another baby, and then the same thing happened again. And, and then people became suspicious because they thought, well, okay, I mean, this, this is pretty rare I and mean, it occasionally happens, but it really doesn't happen very often. And so what are the chances that it would actually happen twice in the same family? Um, and so probably she actually killed them. And so, and this is a real story, right? And so, so people, you know, reported her to the police um, and she was arrested and there was a trial. And so then they, they had a medical doctor, uh, you know, testify as an expert witness. And what he said is, well, you know, so if you take 
people who are middle class or somehow the kind of background that she had, so in that type of families, uh, the chances that a child dies of this sudden death is about one chance in 20,000. About one chance in 20,000. Um, and then they say, well, and so the chances that it happened twice is about one in 20,000 times one in 20,000 which is about one in 400 million. And so that's extremely unlikely. So one chance in 400 million, that's a very small number. It basically doesn't happen. And therefore she probably killed one of the children or both. And so based on that evidence, she was actually sentenced to prison and she spent several years in prison. Um, and then of course the, Eventually, uh, it was overturned and she got out of prison because, of course, the reasoning is completely ridiculous. And th there are two mistakes in the reasoning, right? That are very serious mistakes. So, the first mistake is to simply multiply these two probabilities, right? Because this you can do that if the two events are completely independent. So, in this particular case, the two events happen to two babies from the same mother. So in particular, half of their genes are the same. Because they get sort of one set of genes from their father, one set of genes from the mother, they kind of get mixed up. Uh, but so they have very similar genetic makeup. And one doesn't know uh, whether this sudden infant death syndrome has actually a genetic component. So chances are that there is a bit of a genetic component. And therefore, if one of them dies of it, that means that probably uh, the mother had some genes that predisposed it to that, and then the second child is more likely to also have the same gene, right? And the other thing is one in 400 million sounds like not much, right? It's really small. But then on the other hand, how many families are there in the world? Well, you know, there are 10 billion people in the world, roughly. And so there's about what, 4 billion families or something like this. And so you would expect things that happen once every 400 million times. If you look at the whole world, you would actually expect them to happen because there are just so many people and so many families. And so, you know, we're actually trying in some sense many, many, many times. And so even if it only happens once every 400 million times, if you try billions of times, then it is going to happen, right? Um, and so she was just unlucky to be the person to whom it happened, right? But uh, it's just that it, it would happen to someone, right? It's like, uh, it's sort of the opposite of winning the lottery, right? It's a, like for you, if you play the lottery, the chances that you win is very small. But it doesn't mean that if you happen to win, you've cheated because you know somebody will always win, right? The lottery, or almost always. Right? So just because it's very unlikely for you to win the lottery, it doesn't mean that it's very unlikely that somebody wins the lottery, right? Because there are just many people who play the lottery, and so many people try it. Okay, so that's a and so here this had really this kind of mistake really had the effect of sending that poor person to prison for several years and uh, essentially completely destroying her life. Um, so, the, um, so the other thing I wanted to mention a little bit now in terms of these probabilities is something called conditional uh, probabilities, which is uh, something which is also um, something a little bit tricky. And so there's one little problem that became very famous, which is called the Monty Hall problem. Um, and so, so let me try to sort of explain it to you. So you imagine here that you have three doors. One of them has a car behind it. Okay? Uh, and the other two have a goat. And so then the game is, well, you play the game. And so you choose one door, uh, but you don't open it, right? So you have the three doors here. You choose one, say the first one, um, but you don't open it yet, okay? So all we know is that one of them has a car, 
two of them have a goat. Um, so then there is the other person who would somehow like the TV host, if you want to somehow uh, does conduct the game or conduct the show. So he opens one of the other doors. And every time he does that, so every, you know, imagine this is like a TV show, right? So every time he does it, he always shows a door with a goat. Right? So he opens one of the doors and it shows you, oh, that one has a goat behind it. Um, and so now it gives you, he gives you a choice, right? So it's a little bit like with the two envelopes. Right? So you can either stick to your choice uh, or you can choose your mind. You can change your mind. Right? So you can either say, well, okay, so I think I'm pretty confident I have it right the first time round. I stick with that. And then, you know, you open it and either it has a car or not. And if it has the car, then you won. Or you change your mind and, you know, you decide to open that one. Um, and so what's the smart thing to do? Right? So should you change your mind? Now, it's not completely clear, right? So on the one hand, you would think, well, Okay, so I know that there's one car and two goats, and I know that that door has a goat behind it. Therefore, well, there's two remaining doors. Well, one of them is going to have the car, the other one's going to have the goat. It's 50 50, right? There's no difference between the two doors. Um, and therefore, I mean, a bit like, just like in the envelopes, you know, there was maybe a funny reasoning somehow that wanted to induce me to change, but actually, I shouldn't change because it should really be 50 50. Um, but in, in reality here, you should really always change your mind. So, so in this example here, it generally is the case that you should always change your mind. And what's the reason why you should always change your mind? Well, it's because here you have really obtained additional information, right? Because you know, um, originally, like the chance of actually having picked the car right at the very beginning is what is basically one chance in three, right? Because there are three doors, they all look exactly the same. There's no way for you to know anything. Uh, so you pick one of them at random, the chance that it has the car behind is one in three. Uh, so there's a one in three chance that it has the car. Now, of course, there's also a one in three chance that the middle one has a car, and there's one, one in three chance that the last one has the car. But now the guy shows you that one of the two doesn't have the car. Right? And he shows you that this guy, this door has the goat. But that doesn't change the probability that you've picked the car right in the first place, right? So the chances that you've actually picked it right, here, that doesn't change. It was one in three, right? But now you know that if you actually picked it wrong, which had two chance out of three of happening, well, then the car must be here, right? Because you know that it's not here, okay? um, And so actually now you know that there's actually two chances out of three that the car was here. And so you should really change your mind. Uh, and if you change your mind, then you have actually two chances out of three of winning the game uh, and getting the car. Whereas if you stick to your guards, well, clearly, you know, so since you didn't even need that piece of information, and so you're only going to win once every third time, roughly. But it's kind of a funny problem because uh, it was posed in some um, kind of a, you know, like a newspaper column, if you want, in the US at some point in the 60s. Um, and the person who posed the problem did give this as a solution. And then, you know, very many people didn't believe them. Uh, and apparently even Paul Erdős, who was a very famous mathematician, didn't believe this answer. Uh, and it took a very long time for the person writing the newspaper column to actually really convince people that this is the correct answer. Uh, and in the end, they basically had to convince Paul Erdős also by really simulating the game and showing him that he really should always change his mind. Um, and but so, so this is you know just some kind of funny little game, but there's a very similar kind of situation really shows up. For example, if you study diseases, right, and the, you study like diseases and for example medications that treat diseases, 
So, you know, imagine that you, there's some disease, and it's a deadly disease. Like if you catch that disease, you know you're going to die. Okay. Um, and so it's really bad news. And, but it's fortunately, it's very rare. So it only affects about a person in a million at any one time. Okay, so in a sense that if I take a random person on the street and ask myself, does that person have that disease now, the chance of that is just one in a million. Um, and now say, you know, you have some pharmaceutical company um, and they produce a test which detects that disease, right? And they say the test is 99.9% .9 accurate. Okay, so it sounds like very impressive. Uh, so it's a very accurate test. Uh, and, and it's even, in one sense, it's even certain, like if you have the disease and you take the test, then it's going to tell you for sure, right? So if you have the disease, you take the test, it's going to tell you that you have the disease. Absolutely no doubt. But the reason is, only 99.9% .9 accurate is that, well, if you don't have the disease, sometimes the test gets it wrong and it actually tells you that you have it even though you don't, right? So it may happen that the test is positive. Yeah, well, that's always the funny thing with these tests, right? Positive test actually is bad news usually when you test for diseases, right? So it's, it's called positive because the outcome of the test is that it says something but it says something negative about you, of course, which is that you have the disease. Um, so it has only this accuracy. So it means that even if you don't have the disease and you take the test, there's a one in thousand chance that the test would come back from the doctor and it would tell you, ah, you know, you might have that disease. Um, and so now let's say, well, you, have no particular reason to test, but you know you heard that that pharmaceutical company has has developed that test, and so you decide just to be sure. You know you buy that test because you know that if it comes back negative, you know for sure that you don't have the disease, right? Because it, if you had it, then it, it will tell you for sure, right? And so you want to just have peace of mind, so you want to make sure you don't have the disease, so you buy the test. Um, you test yourself and ah. It comes back positive. And so you might have the disease. Now, the question is how worried should you be? So, is it actually likely or not that you have the disease? Now, you would think that, you know, and this is really the sort of things that you see in the news, right? I mean, you see you have COVID tests and you see the accuracy of your COVID tests is so and so many percent. And so, it's, it's exactly that situation, right? Um, and so you would think, well, it's 99.9% .9 accurate. So if it says I have the disease, well, it means probably that I have a 99.9% .9 chance of having the disease. And so I should write my will already and you know, uh, tell people that I'm going to die in a year. Um, but in fact, that's not the case at all here, right? Because imagine, imagine there's 100 million people in the population, right? So that's a, about the size of Germany, I guess. A little bit more than the size of Germany. Um, so now the disease we said is affects only about one in a million people, right? So it means that there's about a hundred people who are sick, and the remaining ninety nine million nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred people, they are actually healthy. Right? Um, and now let's say we give all. Let's say all of them take the test. So then either it comes back positive or it comes back negative. Now, if the person is sick, then it always comes back positive, right? So that's what I mentioned that the, the test is 100% accurate at actually telling you if you have the disease, if you, if you really have it. So all the guys who are sick, the test is going to say you're sick. But then there's you know, almost 100 million people who are healthy, right? 99 million nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred people are healthy and the test well there's about the one in thousand of those people where the test is going to say well actually you might have the disease so there's actually going to be about a hundred thousand people uh, for which the test is going to say you might have that disease even though they don't and then the remaining guy they are healthy and the test comes back negative right and so the chance of actually being sick, right? If you had no reason 
to do the test. If you don't have any a priori reason to believe that you might be sick, right, then it's really just for peace of mind. You take that test, um, then actually it's much more likely that you are one of the 100,000 healthy people where the test just happens to come back positive than one of the 100 people who are actually sick, right? So it's only, well, there's a thousand more people who are healthy, but where the test comes back positive, then there are people who are actually sick and the test comes back positive, right? So even though the test is 99.9% .9 accurate and it tells you you might have the disease, there's still actually only one a chance in a thousand that you're sick. And so, you know, so you shouldn't worry too much in that case, right? So that's why these numbers, one has to be very careful about what these numbers actually mean, right? When you say that the test has so and so, such and such accuracy, especially in situations where the disease that you test for is actually a pretty rare disease, right? So if it's, so the problem why here things end up being very counterintuitive is because we're really bad at somehow imagining like very things that happen with very, very small probability. Right. Um, and so, so maybe just in the, the last, uh, sort of the last uh, ever 10 minutes uh, of the lecture. Uh, so I wanted to just at the end, tell you a little bit about the sort of things people are actually doing in, you know, probability probability theory. So the sort of thing, you know, actual research mathematicians um, at universities sort of think about. Um, and so one thing that there has been quite a lot of work on in the last, whatever, 10 years or something like that is on some probability models that model this kind of situation, right? Like, so here, what does that picture show? So there's a forest, here and there's a forest fire. Um, and here you see the flame form of the forest fire. Right? Um, and you see that, well, here the forest is still nice and green. Uh, well, and here clearly it was all burnt down, right? So, so the flame form here is kind of moving in this direction. Clearly here it was burnt and here it's still not yet burnt. So it's going to move in this direction. Um, but you see, it's going to kind of move randomly. I mean, here you see already the front is not straight, right? So it has this kind of funny shape, which is kind of very regular here. Um, and then you ask yourself, you know, is there a good probability model that describes, you know, how likely it is to see a given shape for this flame front? And now here we're talking about something like not a random number or just the probability for you know, a yes, no kind of binary outcome. But here you want to actually assign probabilities to functions and things like that. And actually in some sense to movies because you ask yourself not just what's the probability of seeing a given shape at the given time, but what's the probability of seeing it you know, move in a certain way. So you some sense would like to assign probabilities to movies uh, in some sense. And, and there are many kinds of situations that are somewhat similar. So you can think of, so here is an actual, a picture from an actual experiment people did um, where there's some liquid crystal and liquid crystal is, you know, like, uh, like what's your TV screen or like the computer screen you're looking at right now is actually made of a uh, liquid crystal, right? And so these liquid crystals, they, um, they have the property that they come in different, uh, what's called phases. Um, and so depending on their situation, they either let the light go through or not. And so it means if you put a light behind it, you either see it dark or you see it bright. And, and what happened in this experiment is you, you put this liquid crystal in such a state that um, it's in one of these two phases, but this phase is actually not really stable. So it really wants to be in the other one. Right? Um, but what happens is that it's, it's not that easy for it to kind of flip over to the other phase. And so what you do is you hit it with a laser beam and then the laser beam gives it enough energy to flip in the other phase. 
Um, and in practice, what this means is that you have your liquid crystal and you see, say, the bright color. And then with the laser beam, you like paint a strip of the black color on it. But then that black color is going to expand. And so the black guy here is going to move up. And if you want here, there would be white again and it moves down on the other side. So you have this black strip that kind of gets wider. But it does this in a slightly random way. So you see here, it's not quite flat. So you see here, it looks kind of random a bit. Uh, and then again, you ask yourself, can you describe, you know, this random moving one, which shows sort of the border of that black strip moving up. Um, and then there's another thing you can think of is, so this is sort of like one of my favorite toy models, uh, which uh, I call the Tetris model. Um, and so here, what you do is you, I don't know if you can see this, um, now here you imagine just Tetris bricks falling down, right? So I don't know if you can see Tetris bricks uh, on your screen. So, so here you just have Tetris bricks that kind of fall down at random and you don't play Tetris here, right? So they just pile up. Um, but then what you do is you really have loads and loads of them falling down. And so you look at what happens, you know, from much further away. Um, and so you see here, you see that now I have like thousands and thousands of Tetris bricks that have piled up and you see the top of the pile. It also gives me some kind of random curve. Like this, right? And then you ask yourself again, if I take this random curve, how does it actually behave? So kind of have some kind of a mathematical theorem that tells me how this random curve behaves. Um, and that's something that people have actually been working on. So for this particular model, there's no theorem uh, for the one with the Tetris bricks piling up, right? Um, even there's a simpler one, which is a bit like where the Tetris bricks are just single bricks, uh, but instead of just piling up, they also stick to neighbors. So it's a little bit simpler than the Tetris one, but somewhat similar. Uh, and that one is a real model that people have actually tried to study. And even that one, they haven't really succeeded in saying much about it. So it's like a simpler version of this Tetris bricks piling up. And even that actually, you know, people have tried to prove, people have a very good idea of what mathematical theorems would be true, but they have no idea about how to prove them actually. Um, and so here one, one natural model that shows up in this business, uh, which is an actual mathematical model, if you want, that describes this type of situation, um, is this model here, which is called the APZ equation. And so here, maybe I try to explain just a little bit what's this, and then we're going to be done. So that's just five minutes. So here, H, you imagine, right? So you, we had this interface, you think of the flame front moving, for example, so that's my flame front here. And I can think of it as like the graph of a function. Right? So I have space here, and then I have some position, h of x, and h of x is sort of like at every point x, h of x is that distance here. Right? So it's the distance from this horizontal line up to the position of the flame front. Right? And this is going to change in time. So uh, so this position is not just a function of space, but it's actually a function of space and time. That's an X and T. Um, and then this model says that the derivative of this function in the T direction. So remember derivative is like the slope of the function. So the derivative in the X direction, for example, at a given point, say at this point here, is you look at the slope, so you draw the line that sort of follows the function as closely as possible, and then you look at that slope here, right? So you just uh, divide this length by that length. So in this case, it would be a little bit less than one, right? Because this is a little bit less than this. So here at this point, the slope here would be something a little bit less than one. Here, the slope would be something negative. Uh, here, the slope would be zero. Because it's horizontal, right? So that's that's the slope. 
Um, and in this model here, you have, well, some sense the slope of the slope showing up. So this second derivative, it tells you not so much uh, in which direction the curve is moving, but rather than whether it's accelerating or decelerating, right? So for example, this second derivative is negative here because if I draw the parabola that fits the curve at best, the parabola points downwards. So that means here the slope somehow tends to get smaller because it sort of does this kind of motion. Whereas around here, for example, the slope goes up as I move to the right. And so around here, the second derivative would be positive. Right? So you have this model which says that the time derivative is equal to the second derivative plus the square of the slope plus some random term minus a constant. Um, and so this is some something called a partial differential equation. So that's one of the standard type of mathematical objects that people are studying often in analysis. And here, what makes it um, part of probability is that this term here is something random. So you think of actually adding to the right here random values and these values, they're kind of completely random in the sense you take any point in space and in time and you have independent random values. So you just make complete, something completely random uh, here to the right. Uh, and then you can ask yourself, you know, what does solution to this equation look like? And it turns out that what happens is that the solution to this equation looks kind of very rugged. It looks, it really looks more like this for any given uh, instant of time. Um, which is a little bit like what we've seen here, right? These things, they do look pretty rugged here or here, right? It, move, it looks pretty rugged and here also it kind of looks pretty rugged. Uh, so you have this pretty rugged behavior and then it's actually so rugged that it's not even clear what the tangent is. So if you take any point, it's not even clear if the tangent should be like this or like this or, you know, in some sense it moves so fast that in a way the tangent is just sort of vertical at every point. Um, and if the tangent is vertical, well, then this term is just, just infinity, right? Because here, if that line was more like a vertical line, this, then if I look at the slope, then I have a very big number here divided by a very small number. The more vertical it is, the larger the slope is. And when it's actually vertical, the slope is infinite. Right? And here it turns out that the solution is something which is so rugged that the slope is actually infinite at every point. And so this is actually infinity everywhere. Um, and so it turns out that in some sense, this constant here, one has to make it infinity as well to kind of cancel out the infinity that comes from that infinite slope. And then you can ask yourself, you know, does that even still mean anything? I mean, now, now it sounds like completely nonsensical. I'm writing down an equation and I'm telling you, well, there's some kind of solution and the solution behaves so badly that the equation doesn't even have any meaning. Um, and, you know, so you can ask yourself, you know, what meaning does it actually have? Is there a way of giving it a meaning? Um, and so that's something that, you know, people and I was involved in that have kind of actually figured out in the, in the recent years. Uh, how to give meaning to these kind of equations that show up naturally for some of these models. Right? Um, and by now one has a really quite good understanding of them. So, okay, I think I'm at the end of my time. So thanks a lot for your attention, it was a pleasure. Uh, thank you, Martin, uh, for your wonderful, wonderful uh, talk. Uh, so I'm asking the audience to get your questions ready in the chat so Martin can uh, can see them. Uh, and don't be shy to ask questions. Right, uh, so I see already a question about Game of Life. Um, uh, so so that's a, it's, it's a good question. So the so Game of Life, um, so that's something what's called a cellular automaton. Um, and so the way the Game of Life works is you have a, you have a grid like this, 
And then every pixel, if you want, is either black or white. So let's say we start with some black ones. Um, and then you have some rules uh, on how to update it. And I don't remember exactly what the rules are, but somehow depending, like, you know, for every point on the grid, so if you look at what the neighbors are like, um, and then let me actually just check what the rules are exactly. So here's Conway's Game of Life. Um, so here is the rule. So if, if uh, a cell is live and it has less than two live neighbors, um, right? So here the neighbors are the neighbors of this cell are all these guys. So here this guy is alive. So Martin, that they, is, yes. They, they, now we can't see. Oh, now you can't see this. Okay, now you can see the cell again, right? Okay, so here black means alive, white means dead. Uh, and you look at the neighbors, where for, for example, this cell has all of these guys as neighbors. So every cell has eight neighbors. And then the rule is this. Right? So here you see the rule. If you have less than, if a cell is alive and it has less than two, live neighbors, then it dies. Uh, if it has either two or three live neighbors, then it's happy and it continues to live. And if it has more than three live neighbors, then it dies as well, because it's unhappy because there are somehow too many people around. Uh, it's pretty brutal. And if it's dead, then, well, if it has exactly three live neighbors, then it becomes live. So here, um, well, here actually, um, all of them are going to die, I guess, because all my live cells, they just have one live neighbor, uh, which is too little, and so they're going to die. And the ones that are dead, they only have either one or two live neighbors, and so they are still going to stay dead. But if I start, for example, with this, then I guess after one step, uh, these two are going to die. These three are all going to die because they only have one neighbor. But this guy is going to be alive. So after one step, basically this guy is going to be alive and the others are dead. Uh, but then there's only one guy that's alive and then it dies. But you can start with something more complicated and they're actually more complicated initial conditions so that things stay alive for all times and they can make very complicated patterns. So now here, um, this is something which is completely deterministic, right? There's nothing, there's no chance here. There's nothing random. So in that sense, it's a bit different uh, from the kind of models that I've been talking about. But then on the other hand, you can think of variants of that game, which are random, right? When you say, for example, if you have exactly one neighbor, then maybe, well, you flip a coin and then if it comes up heads, you die. And if it comes up tails, you stay alive, right? So you can imagine like slightly random versions uh, of the game of life. And then you could ask yourself, you know, if you have such a random version of the game of life um, and you start running this, well, because it's random, you would think maybe it doesn't matter too much how I actually started. Um, and then that's, not an easy question to answer, for example, right? Like depending on the random rules that you come up with, uh, in some situations, it's quite easy to show that, you know, what you see after a long time doesn't really depend on what you started with. In some cases, it's easy to see that it does depend on what you started with. In some cases, it's actually very hard to see what happens at all. Um, but like one version of this sort of random game of life, if you want, the easiest version is something called the easy model. Um, and that's something that mathematicians have studied uh, actually quite a lot and has lots of very, very interesting behavior. Uh, Martin, there are already some more research questions. So one is a question for a reference uh, on um, the problem with the Tetris blocks. Uh, well, so, so that one, the Tetris block, uh -huh. The problem is that there are basically no mathematical results. And so there is essentially no literature because people haven't really managed to prove any theorem about it. 
There is one, uh, there is one article by uh, Timo Sepalainen. Uh, he didn't, he didn't prove something about the actual Petrus block, but that's like a simpler version that I mentioned. Uh, but actually, the same thing could be proven for the Petrus block. The same proof works. Um, and what he showed is, in some sense, the simplest possible: is that there, there is some kind of average speed at which your pile of Petrus bricks moves up. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not easy. It's, it's not clear what the average speed should be, right? Because you somehow, you know, you know roughly you know, at which speed they fall down, but then the speed at which this moves up depends on how dense they pile up, right? So if they piled up very densely, then it means that it would move up slower because you have to fill in many more blocks, right? Whereas if it's somehow much less dense, then it means that it moves up faster. Mm -hmm. Here, if you look at the picture here, it, it clearly looks like there is a relatively uniform density of bricks, right? So, so this is something that one can actually prove. Uh, but for example, this density of bricks depends on the slope of the pile. So if you started, instead of starting with no pile, so you start flat, you see if instead of starting with that, you started with a pile that's already sort of diagonal like that, like an infinite kind of diagonal pile like this, and you do the same thing, uh, then the density you would see would actually be different. You would see a slightly different density. So it depends on the slope. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin, can you tell me again the name of the person who proved that result? Uh, so that's Timo. I can write it in the chat. So uh -huh. Timo, Thank you. Timo Sepalainen. Uh, and there are some umlauts on some of the A's. <laughs> I will look up the <laughs> reference. And, 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 uh, and, and the paper, I don't remember what's the name of the paper, but it's on, I think it was in 1999, maybe. And it's in Amal. I remember that it was in Amal's of Paul mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't swear about the year. It's relatively old issue, but well, maybe about 20 years old. It's maybe either nine now, or maybe early 2000s or something. So are you actively thinking about this problem, Martin? Sorry? Are you actively thinking about this problem? Would we uh, have competition with you? <laughs> um, not, not really actively, I would say. I mean, I think in some sense, the general feeling is that it's a bit too hard to attack head on. And so people would actually want to have in some sense some, some kind of wedge. Uh, in a way, it's the sort of thing I think people have it in the back of their minds, and if they see a suitable wedge, they would kind of recognize it in some sense, right? but, but they haven't seen the wedge yet. So to understand correctly that you have a drawer full of problems. Um, that yeah, you... well, I think I guess most people have a bit of a drawer of problems somewhere in the, in yeah. the back of their head. Right? So Martin, uh, maybe also to summarize some of the other questions in the chat uh, and something that we already uh, that already came up in the first lecture. Do you have a favorite book? Or is there a book that has influenced you more than any other? Um, difficult to say. So I mean, I guess, okay, so I guess one of the first Mark books I sort of looked at when I was a teenager uh, was a book that's called The Beauty of Fractals. And I think probably many people have looked at that book. By Hans Otto Petkin. Is that correct? Yes, yes, that's the one, uh, which has many beautiful pictures um, and but also some nice explanations that go with it. Uh, but but it's a, I mean, in some sense, it's it's a nice book, really, just also just from an aesthetic point of view, right? I mean, it somehow shows that very simple mathematical rules can produce some very complex and very beautiful pictures. So is beauty and aesthetics, is that important for you? Is that for you as a mathematician? I mean, you're working with very rough, uh, <laughs> uh, on very hard and very rough problems, but uh, you discover you, you, you discover structures. 
Yeah, um, yeah. That. And just because things are rough doesn't mean that they're not pretty. Um, so you are one of those. <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah, then, no, but I think I think beauty. I mean, okay. So there's I mean, a there's beauty, for everyone. There's a who is um, so I'm old enough to recall uh, a quote by G. H. Hardy that there's no place for ugly mathematics. Um, <laughs> But people um, disagreed, including uh, his very close collaborator, Littlewood. Right. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's true that sometimes, I mean, it does happen occasionally, right? I mean, like you, you, you need something, you want some results, and then you need to figure out a way of proving it. And that just doesn't seem to be a nice way of proving it. But there is some kind of brute force approach that actually works and it's just painful and long or something and then you just you know bite the bullet and do it um but usually i mean there's much more satisfaction in having a kind of nice argument that's somehow beautiful that is you know something surprising happening uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess I guess you sort of need both. But of course, you're looking for the beautiful ones. <laughs> you don't always find them. Uh, there's a question by Ashia. Ashia, would you like to uh, to ask uh, ask Martin yourself? Is Ashia is turning his microphone on. You're still muted, Ashia. So uh, maybe uh, I can get a head start. Uh, so what is uh, Amadeus? Uh, uh, Amadeus, Dio, Amadeus <laughs> I guess Ashir uh, is asking, uh, and he's um, uh, asking uh, about the relationship uh, between mathematics and uh, music. Uh, yeah, so, okay, so Amadeus is a, actually I can, since since I'm, I'm sharing screen, I can actually just uh, open it. So, so that's an uh, audio editor. And so, so you can, uh, so it's an audio editor where you can, you know, open piece of music or piece of sound, and then you can do all sorts of, you know, you can edit it, you can copy paste things, apply effects to it and so on. Uh, and it's something that I wrote, uh, I developed it myself. I, well, I kind of started working on that in high school, actually, um, and then and then continued during my studies, um, and then well, on and off, I still somehow maintain it. You know, make sure that it continues to work and it still kind of works. Uh, and so, yeah, so I've been doing that as a hobby uh, in a way that's essentially unrelated to mathematics, even though there is some mathematics, so you can do. Uh, you know, you can analyze these things. So, for example, here you can see, um, you know, if you want, you have frequencies vertically. So, high frequencies means, you know, high sounds are sort of on the top of the screen, uh, low sounds are towards the bottom, and the color means how strong they are. Right? And so, you can kind of show uh, a sound in this way, you can kind of turn it into a picture this way. Uh, and there, of course, there's some you know, nice mathematics involved. So it's called a windowed Fourier transform. Um, so that's a Fourier transform. So certainly if you go on and study mathematics, or even if you study basically any science subject, you're going to see uh, Fourier transforms at some point. So that's a very, very important mathematical tool to analyze all sorts of signals. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so I've been doing that kind of as a hobby. Um, in terms of, I mean, of course, math and music are related in, in lots of ways. I mean, I guess in some sense, there's maybe a bit more relations than between, okay, so the question is if it's, they seem as connected as any other two fields like math and fine art or, math and or psychology and economics. Um, I mean, I guess, yes and no. I mean, it's clear that of course one can always find some kind of connections uh, between any two fields. Um, I would say one connection between math and music, of course there's, in a way there's naive connections in the sense that, you know, 
music is really in some sense just a function or sounds are just a function is pressure as a function of time then you can analyze that mathematically in all sorts of ways you can do a mathematical theory of sort of notes and you know what harmonics and what does it why is it that some notes play well together and so on um, and in some sense in, in that sense music lends itself more to kind of qualitative analysis in that sense than maybe paintings or so um, but there's also another one which is that music is called a, sort of intrinsically abstract right uh, so it's a it's a purely abstract kind of form of art or pretty much a purely abstract uh, art form you're not trying to represent something Right. So if you compare music to a painting, it would really be much more like a completely abstract painting rather than something that shows, you know, a landscape or a person or a fruit or something. Um, you're not trying to depict something to, to reproduce some bit that you would see somehow in nature. Um, and so in that sense, it's a little bit similar to mathematics also, because in some sense, mathematics is kind of a purely abstract art form also. Um, so, yeah, so I would say that that's the main link uh, between mathematics and music is that they are kind of the two purely abstract art forms. Uh, I don't hear you anymore. Oh, thank you, please. thank you, Martin. Uh, does oh. anyone want to ask a question personally? Don't be shy. Martin's a really nice guy. <laughs> So there's another, uh, Xenia, here's a question. Yeah, um, it would be really great if you could uh, answer. I was wondering if there's any essential difference about possibilities and probabilities. So we're talking about probabilities today. And is there anything, is possibility something different? Because for me, it was always like, there a possibility is something more broad. So there's possibility that tomorrow the, I don't know, I will find a million dollars in my bed. And the probability of it is very little because I know in my life that there is no reason for them to be there. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I would say the difference is that, I mean, so in probability theory, you would look at all the different possibilities, right? But then what's interesting is, to you is not just which what possibilities are there but actually how likely they are right so and as you say it's much more likely not to find a million dollar under your bed tomorrow uh, than it is to find a million dollar under your bed right so the probability would be extremely small and so so in that sense in a way i would think of probability as being a broader it's it's not really the same concept right but it's somehow the thinking about what are the different possibilities would be like a prerequisite before you can actually talk about probabilities, right? So you need to first ask what could possibly happen uh, before you ask yourself, you know, how likely it is that this happens rather than that. Does that make some kind of sense? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Xenia. Uh, Ivan. Would you uh, turn your uh, video on? Would you mind? Uh, video, yeah. Cool. Uh, hi, Martin. Uh, hi. I would like to say uh, thank you for your lecture. And uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, is Amadeus kind of uh, an analog for FL Studio apps and other, and then other apps that like uh, work with music? and what are similarities uh, of Amadeus and Bell Studio and like other apps? Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of similar to WavePad, for example, or to uh, probably like Audition is one that's somewhat similar. But I mean, it's, 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 some, it's more or less a, standard if you want waveform editor so it has similar functions that most waveform editors have also like pro tools or something like that 
Uh, so it's kind of similar to one of these pieces of software. Um, I mean, the thing is that you see at the time when I started doing that, there weren't that many of these pieces of software around. Uh, so there was basically, so, so I kind of always had a Mac because my, my, my parents bought a Mac when I was a kid. And, and so I was always um, programming on that. Uh, and at the time there was basically one piece of software uh, which was called sound edit, uh, which doesn't exist anymore. But at the time there was that one piece of software which could somehow deal with sounds. Um, and then what I actually wanted to do is I wanted to take part of some kind of uh, high school science competition. So it was not, so it's not the math Olympiad. So it was a science competition rather than math competition, if you want. Um, and, and so what I wanted to do for that science competition, the idea I had as a project uh, for the science competition, what do, was to be able to take a, a recording of a piece of music and then to find out, to have the computer find out what's the musical score. Um, and, and so I wanted to do that. But then of course, in order to be able to do that, the first thing I had to be able to do is to actually take a musical recording and get it into the computer somehow. Right? Um, and so I started by basically writing the piece of software that just you know, takes the recording and puts it into the computer, allows you to actually record a piece of sound uh, and then you know, shows it on the screen and uh, you know, allows you to show the waveform and sort of play with it. Um, and so that was, in some sense, it was like step number one in the project. Uh, and then in some sense, the project never went much beyond step number one. <laughs> but, uh, but it's still, uh, right. So, I mean, so now I've kind of continued developing that aspect, if you want. And the, the other aspect ended up being too hard in a way. And coming from you, <laughs> Martin. Well, people, are, I mean, by now it's pretty much a solved problem, but it took a very long time. So now there is a piece of software called Melodyne that actually does that basically, but it's a relatively recent piece of software and it really uses all these, you know, machine learning algorithms and, you know, these techniques uh, that obviously weren't around at the time. And, you know, require the sort of computational power that you didn't have at the time at all. There's uh, Constantine. Yeah, hi. Um, I have one question. So does there exist um, any general models of tricky conditional problems? So for example, uh, from one perspective, the probability would appear to be something, but it would actually be something else. Um, well, I mean, that's a little bit, right, so, so it's the thing, I guess, uh, that I mentioned at the very beginning, right, which is that the same event could be assigned different probability from the perspective of different people, right, like the example of the coin toss, where I just toss a coin and I look at it, but I don't show it to you. Uh, and then if I see heads, then from my point of view, the probability it came up heads is one, because I know that it came up heads for sure. I've seen it already. But for your point of view, it's still a half because you have no clue, right? Um, so, and it generally is a half for you, right? So you just don't have the information to say anything more than that. Uh, so, so it, so this happens very often, right? That uh, the same event can have different probabilities when viewed from different perspectives. Now, of course, in mathematics, in some sense, that part isn't really part of mathematics per se. It's really more part of the, you know, the step where you take an actual real world situation and you translate it into mathematics, right? And then there's, you translate it from the perspective, whether you translate it from the perspective of myself or from your perspective, it would end up with slightly different mathematical descriptions. Right? Um, but that's somehow very common. You know? so there isn't really just 
one, if you want, canonical model for conditional probabilities. Martin, what is, may I ask, uh, maybe the question was also a little bit about where to find other need such problems to, to explore. What was the first probability book that you learned from that you thought was really good? Oh, I, I, you know, I'm not a good example because, uh, you know, when, <laughs> when so, so when I studied, when I was an undergrad, there was no probabilist at the University of Geneva. So I basically never had any probability course when I was an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. uh, and in high school, we had a little bit of, you know, we did some probability, we had some, you know, like uh, card game type problems or things like that, uh, which at the time I didn't particularly like. So I wasn't terribly interested in probability when I was in high school. And then in university, we didn't have any probability uh, because there was basically no probabilist. Uh, uh, in Geneva, and so the only probability I was exposed to at university was more really statistics for some people from CERN, uh, and that I wasn't terribly keen on. And so then it was really more during my PhD studies that I actually discovered probability. Uh, but so then, I, in some sense, I had just you know learned things like that and then just by looking at papers and things like that so i didn't actually ever learn probability by looking at the probability book so oh okay so maybe maybe it's it's not exactly <laughs> advice <laughs> but it's, it's yeah. i don't think that that would be best advice necessarily but uh so yeah so i i'm not really sure what to recommend as a, in some sense elementary probability book or so because I never really read any elementary probability book. So maybe somebody in the audience has good recommendations and can post them to the chat. Yeah. And um, I also somehow I, I ended up never teaching elementary probability either. So uh -huh. the elementary courses that I've taught were always analysis of other probabilities. Uh, as Asini, what's your question? Let's hear your question. Good evening. In your today's presentation, you have shown us a lot of examples with the link to, to the, some academic works with some clear connection to real world examples. And I question, my question is about how to find this topic which is linked to the real world and has this academic, uh, some underlying assumptions. Thank you. Yeah, so that, that's that it's a good question. It's sort of the general question of how do you, you know, how do you find a good mathematical problem to work on? Um, and I mean, I think as a, you know, first young student and then, uh, then young researcher, um, it's, I mean, by now, mathematics is enormous, right? And so you somehow look at what's going on and there's so many things that it, it seems like completely impossible to somehow figure out what has been done what has not been done what's interesting what's not interesting and so on um, and that's where it's really important to actually have a good advisor uh, as a student who would you know like take you by the hand basically and show you one problem that they think is interesting uh, but they think that you might still be able to actually say something about it uh, which is different from what people have done before. Um, and then usually you somehow start exploring from there, right? I mean, so, but then by the time you somehow get, become part of some community, and then there's usually, you know, in some sense within the different mathematical communities, there, there tend to be, you know, there is some sort of a hive mind in some sense where, you know, where people have some kind of idea of what, what problems are interesting, what problems are not so interesting, what other sort of things that in principle we know that one can kind of do if one really wants to do it, and so it's not terribly interesting, uh, which are the things that are interesting because they also have other connections to, you know, to other interesting problems, maybe in other areas or so. And I think that that's something that one really needs to be part of the community. So, so that's the part where in some sense it's important to also end up you know, going to conferences and talking to people and just get some, you know, some feeling of what's actually going on and what are people talking about and what, what are people interested in. Um, and that's really the sort of the job in some sense of your, your supervisor, your 
PhD advisor or maybe master's thesis advisor uh, to kind of you know bring you into one of these mathematical communities that you know you then kind of once you're in some sense in the world of mathematics then you kind of start exploring on your own. Thank you, Martin. Paul, okay. would you uh, turn your camera on for a moment? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, um, for not having a camera around because I'm on my PC. So, oh no, uh, that's sorry. okay. Okay, um, but just I don't know if now there's enough time. But uh, could you just briefly explain the main idea how to make sense of this last differential equation um, without restricting the the psi? Because I I don't know how to. I mean, yeah, this. Is not differential. I, I I don't I don't really understand how to make sense of it, um, yeah. or how to prove um, existence of a, of a solution or something. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I think it's, it might be tough to do a five minutes uh, crash course on that. But um, so so one thing is that if it wasn't for this term so somehow if you forget about this and you just keep that bit um then this is something linear so so an equation like this there is an actual solution so there is a formula right so if you have an equation like uh, dth is equal to dx squared h plus something anything any function f then there's a formula so h is somehow t and x is equal to you know some integral of some e to the minus x minus y square or whatever two t or four t or something like that uh, t minus s I guess function of y and s and then it's integrated against y and s or something like this uh, I guess here there's a square root of t minus s so there, there's some kind of explicit formula okay it doesn't really matter what the formula is uh, but you can write down a formula for the solution. And the formula is just some nice smooth function integrated against that. And so this formula actually makes sense, even if this guy is very irregular, right? So this equation here always has a solution, even if this guy is really, really badly behaved. And even if it's what's called a distribution, which is not even a function, that's actually what one has to use here. Um, and then one wants to, in some sense, do these things as some sort of perturbation of this. So you would say, maybe, you know, let me call that one, whatever, H0 or something like this. Uh, and now I put this Xi here, right? So now this guy exists. I know what it is. There's some sort of explicit formula. And then you could ask yourself, I could look at a, you know, H1 plus dx h0 square, say uh, plus psi minus c. Right now you could say, ah, maybe I can actually find a solution to this equation. Now that's not exactly the same as this equation here, right? Because here instead of h1, I have the h0, which is itself a solution to a different equation, but it's a different equation which looks somewhat similar. And then you can ask yourself here, how do I have to choose this constant so that at least this term here has a meaning? And that one has a chance of being able to analyze it. So what happens is that here you replace this guy by some kind of smoothened out version. So you introduce some small parameter, which mathematicians always call epsilon. Um, and basically you say, uh, here, instead of things being independent at every point in space time, you say, ah, oh, it's actually smooth, but it's smooth in such a way that if things are distance more than epsilon apart, they're independent. But if they are less than epsilon apart, then they depend on each other because the function is actually smooth. Right? So, so you replace you approximate this by something smooth. Um, and then you can ask yourself, um, how should I choose this constant? as a function of this small parameter so that this term actually has a limit when this guy goes to zero. And then it turns out one can show that you can choose this constant in such a way that this has a limit. 
Um, and then in some sense, you're kind of one step closer. Uh, and okay, now that doesn't tell you why you can actually solve the real equation that you started from, but at least it tells you, you know, some kind of a first step. Um, and then what you end up doing is sort of like a more sophisticated version of some argument along these lines. So do you apply this um, inductively and then show that there is a limit or something or? Yeah, no, so not really. So, so in, right, so you could think that, okay, so, so what I wrote here that suggests and right, that I could actually define sort of an n plus one guy with an n guy here somehow and then try to somehow let the n go to infinity. Um, and that's what um, physicists in some sense tend to do. And then they say, well, okay, we think it converges or so. Uh, but this is very difficult to show that this actually has a limit if you send, right? If you, you set up an induction like this, and you try to show that this induction converges to something for large n, um, then that doesn't actually work. So, so the argument is more sophisticated than that. Uh, but it's a bit, yeah. So actually to explain the actual argument would really take way too long. Okay, okay, but thanks, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. We have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, Nipo, I cannot read the Ukrainian name of, uh, you have uh, pink hair. Uh, well, uh, you can ask your question. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry about name. No, <laughs> I, I have. I'm sorry. Uh, I have question about that. You told that uh, in math, uh, so important that uh, the math will be beautiful, but uh, how does, uh, uh, how to do always Beauty mass, like uh, if, if usually we have a lot of uh, examples where we uh, trying to use some formulas or something like that, and there bigger part of time uh, no beauty mass, and uh, we have this time of beauty mass just in, for example, first and uh, last steps. Or something like that. Uh, I'm not sure I really understood what what you asked. Uh, did you understand, Michael? Uh, not quite. Can you briefly explain in Ukrainian or in your language? Can uh, Ola, could you please write your question in, in a chat to, uh, to understand it, we to try to understand it together with Michael and Martin. Or maybe she could, if she asks in Ukrainian, and then maybe you can try to translate. Ah, oh, so now I think that, oh no. <laughs> oh. Okay, Is we it... will be back with that question. Uh, is there another question? Hmm. Yes, so th there was one question in the chat, which was about if I'm exploring fractals. And actually, in, in probability, very often the probabilistic objects that show up have some type of fractal structure. Um, so, so, for example, uh, is one of the well, even if you don't, so I think you can see this again now. This pile of Petrus bricks. Uh, so here, actually, if you look at the, this curve at the top, that actually has some fractal structure. So, in the sense that you can, you know, if you zoom out or you zoom in, um, it it always, if you zoom in the right way, it somehow more or less looks the same at every scale. Uh, and so it has some kind of fractal structure. Or you can have other, you know, there are lots of, so let me actually show you another little, so that's a different kind of uh, 
it's a different probability sort of little polymodel and probability that I can of so that one is one that is actually easier to study. Uh, so that one there are theorems about. So okay, so I'm not going to describe what the model is, but you end up with these kind of structures. You see? And so here you also have some kind of fractal structure uh, that shows up. You can look at this, you know, from far away. Uh, you know, like here, I can look at it from from very far, or I can look at it from very close. And here, it sort of it appears to look different here, but actually, if you run it for a while, um, then uh, whichever scale you look at, it actually kind of looks the same. Uh, and so you also have this fractal structure that shows up. And that's, uh, that's something somehow very common in probability theory. Somehow like the type of probabilistic objects that mathematicians study often have some type of fractal structure. So Martin, uh, actually I wonder in your research, uh, do you use these simulations? Are they important for you to discover? Uh, sometimes I use them to actually get impression. So yeah, because so for example, this one, the one that you see on the screen right now, um, so, so that model, we actually thought that it converges to something completely different. And then that's all we tried to prove this with a postdoc of mine. Um, and then, you know, after two months, we were not getting anywhere. And it somehow more and more looked like it just wasn't true, the thing that we thought was true. Um, and then at some point I got fed up and I said, okay, I'm just going to simulate the thing to see what's actually true. Um, and then and then you see you know, this beautiful kind of picture, uh, which was not at all the one that I actually expected to see. And so then clearly the thing that we were trying to prove was clearly wrong because uh, the picture was clearly different from what I expected. Um, and then uh, once we got sort of unblocked by trying to prove something wrong, uh, then it ended up being actually quite easy to describe the limiting behavior of this uh, of this model. So what is simulated here is now uh, a theorem? Uh, right. So, well, so there is a theorem that actually describes uh, this, and that says that you can you know you can zoom out as far as you want, but you what you see is always kind of going to be the same. Uh, and it gives a mathematical description of the thing that you're going to see. Very cool. Okay, uh, so um, uh, I, I propose that we call it an evening uh, for some for some members of our audience. I guess it's uh, a very early morning. Uh, thank you very much again, uh, Martin. This was a beautiful talk. In the uh, dear audience, thank you for your participation. It's really great to have such a diverse group uh, of uh, young mathematicians in the audience. Um, we are going to continue our special lectures tomorrow uh, uh, with Herbert Koch, uh, who is going to talk about the dynamics of the quadratic family. And I hope that uh, uh, I will see very many of you um, in, uh, tomorrow. So thanks for joining us. Uh, and thank you again, Martin. It was really uh, great to spend time with you. It was a pleasure. Uh, okay, it's good to see you again. Yeah. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank, you. thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye.